what is my best save of the year? I think my best save of the year just happened two weeks ago. Uh, we have a case presentation of a 55-year-old man with hypertension who suddenly became unresponsive and pulseless after having sex with his wife on a Saturday afternoon two weeks ago. And uh, he had been complaining of chest pains on exertion for two to three weeks, saw the ER twice and was ruled out, and was scheduled for an outpatient nuclear stress test. The wife started CPR, of course, once she noted that he was unresponsive and called EMS, and he arrived to an outside hospital completely in PEA arrest. He got three rounds of epinephrine, leading to V-fib from PEA, and he got a 300 milligram IV amiodarone dose and a 200 joule shock, which returned to spontaneous circulation. But he had 20 minutes of downtime, and this is at an outside hospital with no cath lab. So they call me up. Over there, they show ST elevation anteriorly, and this is your EKG. Almost agonal looking, but still with the P wave somewhere, pretty nasty. So uh, I, call, I say, bring him over. Um, in transit, he has a recurrence of PA arrest upon arrival in the ambulance, and in arrival, they're giving him CPR. He has epinephrine, uh, two milligrams in total. Amiodarone, again, brings him back to V-fib, and he gets this, uh, shocked twice to sinus rhythm. The heart rate of 92 and a blood pressure, surprisingly, of 130 over 60. That's an additional 10 minutes of downtime for him. His lactate is greater than 10. His ABG shows a pH of 6.96, PCO2 of 66, PO2 of 57% on 100% FiO2 with a PEEP of 12. So would you take this guy to the cath lab? Questions? That's, that, those are incredible numbers. Uh, I would say no uh, at this point. Uh, perhaps uh, not rule it out completely, uh, but uh, wait uh, some 12 hours, maybe with some cooling ter therapy, and see if his you know, uh, metabolic profile and hemodynamics stabilize, because uh, his mortality right now would appear to be just through the roof. Yeah, I would say at least his mortality is uh, clearly above 50% if you do nothing. And so I think, Arnold, if you don't take him now and you wait, uh, you're taking that 50% and converting to 100%. So uh, the major issue with all of this is public reporting as well as outcomes for a cath lab, and I think these are the types of patients we need to all advocate to be uh, uh, adjudicated independently because you take enough of these, you will save some. So, so my vote, and, and we, we debate this every single time, is we end up taking these because as a witness to rest, uh, got CPR virtually the whole time, and so uh, you have to give them the benefit of the talent, and he's relatively young. And, you know, I mean, I don't need to, if this is in Long Beach, here his saturation would be 50% at altitude. I mean, we this would be somebody who, if you're going to really take him to the lab, you're going to be doing ECMO or ECLS, uh, you know, throwing in an impella and hoping that his lungs are going to help you is, uh, is going to be problematic. So, I mean, this really becomes a, a more complex strategy of you're going to need, you know, cardiopulmonary support plus, uh, you know, a, a PCI intervention, so. Yeah. Would you, would support you take them? First, right. Support first, yeah. absolutely. So, right, right. I mean, I think all the things that uh, Mr. Shams said mm -hmm. in terms of his age and the promptness of CPR and the fact that we're not treating numbers, we're treating the patient. Mm -hmm. So we want to, I, regardless of the reporting thing, you know, we would take and, and these aren't, well, in different, you know, every state has its own challenges because yeah. these aren't publicly reported in every state. You know, they're unique, you know. It, it, Although I think it's not just, you know, uh, keeping the guy alive, but also neurologic function. I agree he's had good CPR, uh, but, you know, there's just been a good amount of time here that he's been down. Uh, I think there should just be a good, healthy discussion with uh, family and the team members to, to understand that, yeah, you can get him back, but... Neurologically, uh, some of these uh, come out devastated. I agree, and that's frustrating if you don't have that discussion up front. But I think giving them a 48 hour window is not. So these are really great points and things that were running through my mind. Uh, but because of his young age and, uh, and neurologically, exactly what Tayo said, um, he was fighting us on the ventilator and seemingly having purposeful movements. He was not posturing. And so I actually didn't hesitate at all when we slapped an echo on him and saw an EF of about 40% still. After epi, I said, let's bring him up right away. And just, to, just so everyone knows, as you guys were referencing, when your lactate is that high, your chances are pretty poor uh, of having a good outcome. In this study of 180, 100, 250 patients uh, from PLS1, your, your chance of survival was, was fairly low with a poor outcome when your lactate initially or at 12 hours was still high. And the, it had a very strong uh, 7.54 uh, 7 odds ratio 
for an admission lactate above four, and this is above 10. Uh, but things that are helpful are when you're younger or when you have a cardiac origin of the shock. And so these are things to keep in mind. So they, they measured also the pH, another study in acute medical surgical journal, uh, that no patient in this 170 patient uh, cohort had, with a pH less than 6.95 had a favorable neurologic outcome, and that the best cutoff was 80% sensitivity and specificity for us a pH of 7.05. So I've heard this from surgeons. They say, I won't take this guy because he's, he's, he's been down for too long and his pH is too low. So uh, I had those things keeping it in mind. But just like you said, the unfavorable prognostic factors included a low pH, severe lactic acidosis, a prolonged downtime, and PA arrest originally, initially, which has about a, about a 1% to 5% survival rate to hospital discharge, and he certainly had an unstable arrhythmia. But you know, we had to balance that with the favorable prognostic factors, which was a, a witness arrest, bystander, if you can call her that, a CPR, uh, a V-fib rhythm, ultimately, a young age, and he was male, and a lack of comorbidities, a cardiac cause of his cardiac arrest, and uh, purposeful movements. So on his echo at bedside after the uh, epinephrine, I saw a reasonably good EF and no evidence of other coronary disease except for that anterior wall. So I said, well, let's bring him up right away and open up the artery. And I actually, you know, I, maybe I took too much uh, for granted. The blood pressure was still 130 to 150 after the epinephrine. So I went ahead and started with a balloon pump. And I'm going to get some, I'm going to get some uh, eyes. I, Dr. Kapoor is already looking at me funny. What are you thinking? Uh, <laughs> I did a fem femoral balloon pump um, and, a, uh, and, a, right, and a radial uh, diagnostic. She found a 70% right coronary artery lesion. That clearly wasn't the, uh, the culprit. And uh, with the balloon pump, I dipped into the LV just because I, I had an echo. I know what the EF was, but I wanted to know what the EDP was. And so the EDP here... Uh, you guys can think about how to read this, but he is on positive pressure ventilation, so I'll remind you that you take the lower number, and in this case, his EDP was only 15 to 18. So I said, hmm, he seems to be getting pretty well unloaded. I actually, actually can give him some fluids, despite the pulmonary edema. And with the uh, augmented pressures still in the 90s, 100s, uh, even after the epinephrine wore off, I thought I was doing pretty well. So uh, the intervention itself is pretty non-exciting. It's a proximal LED lesion that we, uh, you know, opened up under balloon pump support, and... Uh, that was the final result. And uh, everything looked pretty good here. His blood pressure is still in the low 100s. So at four hours, with a balloon pump only, his lactate was 4.2. And at 24 hours, it was 1.8. He had full resolution of his acidemia, hypoxemia even. The pulmonary edema magically went away because you're actually pumping it out of the lungs. He had weaning of vasopressors and FiO2. Within 24 hours, he was down to 40% FiO2. His EEG and CT were negative, And he seemed to be obeying commands in the next two days. His IBP was removed on hospital day number three, and he was extubated on hospital day number four. And one week later, just last week, he had some mild memory problems, but he had a mini mental status exam of 29, and this is him with his lovely family. So uh, my take home here was that, you know, anyone who's having sex with his wife two, on a Saturday afternoon two weeks ago is, is, has, a, has a life worth saving. And, uh, <laughs> he, must be, he, he must be doing pretty well. So I guess the only open questions in the last few minutes are, you know, to uh, fix the RCA and when, and then life vest or not. And then critique of my use of the, of the balloon pump as opposed to the impella, which, you know, granted. Maybe if you need the balloon pump, perhaps you didn't need it. Now right. If you have to do the joint contraction, the LED will go. That's what we just on the LED, and that's all he needs. That's certainly a point. Mm -hmm. I would say that uh, it, it's a great example, and sometimes uh, that's what's most immediately and rapidly available in every cath lab. So setting up a balloon pump takes virtually no time. So I, I, I can understand why uh, that might have been a strategy. I would say that not knowing the outcome, I probably would have unloaded the LV first, and I think that, uh, uh, and then gone ahead and, and done the LAD. Um, with maybe a more aggressive strategy, it turned out uh, this this worked out well, and I think and and at the same time, I think you've shown that uh, you can you can use this strategy and it can work out well as well. Let me go back a little bit. Do you think when he originally showed up at the index hospital hospital, is it worth it to give lytics as you transfer a relatively young patient with a big anterior STEMI? That's great. a question. Uh, great question. So what what um, do people think about that? I, CPR. Yeah, CPR. And CPR. That's the issue, That's right? The issue. So this patient, uh, I think he did well because we assumed the lactate was all from the cardiac dysfunction, but this was an open artery by the time he came to you. So yeah. it was probably that they got, the guy got so sick because of the, uh, the poor response or the downtime uh, of the resuscitation. 
And so that's why the patient, you know, once he was stabilized better, the heart had enough reserve. But it's, it's very hard to know that, you know, a priori, and that's why support devices oftentimes we put them in, let the dust settle, and if you didn't need it, you didn't need it. Uh, but if you did need it, then at least you have it. And you guys didn't end up cooling him. We, I'm sorry, we did, we did end up cooling him. The, the neurologist said, oh, you know what, uh, he's doing so well, he's already purposeful that, you know, just keep him not hyperthermic, just don't let him have a fever. So we kept him at 36.5, even 37. And that increasingly, according to the most recent trial, as you know, 36 degrees may be as good as 32 to 34. Just to defend myself, I'm not, uh, I'm going to show you this other case because I am not opposed to using a, an impella. <laughs> this woman came in for a non ischemic cardiomyopathy, an actual motor vehicle accident, and she actually had a, um, chest pressure and palpitations thereafter. And she came in conversant, walking around the ED, but with a heart rate of 120. And over the next, two, never, next 13 hours, sitting around in our ED, her lactate went up from 3.9 to 7.1 to 11. And she was still walking around and finally got intubated for respiratory distress as her lactic acidosis worsened. This unexplained lactic acidosis was clearly due to a stress cardiomyopathy, uh, rapid pulmonary edema, normal, totally normal coronary arteries despite her cardiac history of having a mitral valve replacement. And just merely with the impella alone, we, we were able to unload her ventricle from an EF of less than 20%. And we changed her lactate from 11 to 5 to 2.9 over 12 hours. And she ultimately needed a tandem heart because of hemolysis, transferred to an LVAD center for observation. But she had full recovery without an LVAD. And uh, just to show you that I do use the impella once in a while. <laughs> okay. Super. Thank you very much. Thank you.